Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and welcome, everyone, to the Get Housing Right Conference presented by the University of Rhode Island Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies with support from Homes RI. I'm James Diosa. I'm the former mayor of Central Falls, Rhode Island. And it's been a pleasure to be able to join this conversation today. Today's panel, Creating Community by In for Expanded Affordable Housing, presents the stories and reflections of elected officials who sought to codify a comprehensive approach to housing, prioritizing racial equity and environmental sustainability. Before I introduce our esteemed panelists, I wanna cover a few points of order. Our panelists will present for approximately 15 minutes each. We are going to hold questions until all presentations have concluded. We have scheduled about 30 minutes for Q&A session, which should leave us with plenty of time to have a lively conversation. I encourage everyone in the audience to enter your thoughts and questions into the chat. You can do this while our panelists are presenting or wait until the Q&A session. You can do this while our, our panelists are presenting. Um, I promise to keep an eye on the chat throughout this event and ask our panelists your hard hitting questions. Now I'm happy to introduce our first panelist. Our first panelist is Lisa Bender and she's the former city council president in Minneapolis. Lisa. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Lisa Bender. Coming from the city of Minneapolis, I served for eight years on the Minneapolis City Council, two four-year terms from 2014 to 2021. So I just left office in January. And during that time, I was first the chair of our zoning and planning committee, and then the president of the city council elected by the body. And in those eight years, I led a lot of policy change in housing and related topics. I mean, everything's related to housing. So um, worker protections, uh, minimum wage law, transportation, climate justice. Um, so I'm excited to be here. I'm gonna share my screen so that I can um, keep on track and, and do a truncated version of our story so that we have plenty of time for conversation. So I'm just gonna fiddle with the screen so that I can share my presentation here. I think I have to share my screen first and then go over to PowerPoint. So let me do it that way. Share screen. This one from beginning. There we go. Okay. So I'll give you a quick overview of what I want to talk about today and welcome conversation and questions. So back in 2018, about halfway through my time in office, we adopted a comprehensive approach to policy, housing policy as part of our overall master plan for the city called Minneapolis 2040. Um, both before and after that, um, our approach to housing policy change has been very incremental. Um, and we were really intentional about our goals, particularly around race equity and climate change. And those goals were identified through an extensive public process that I'll talk about in a little bit. I think one of the biggest shifts for us was moving from a project by project decision making process that was often very political. So every time a new apartment building was proposed or a new street reconstruction was proposed, the city tended to do a project based process to make decisions. Um, and like a lot of other things, the folks who had the most time and political power had a huge amount of influence over those decisions. It was really hard for the average person to follow what was going on or become experts in zoning to participate and have their voice heard. So the biggest shift that we made in housing and other policy areas was to take a citywide approach and to make our land use and zoning um, predictable citywide and to make sure there weren't particular neighborhoods that were carved out, um, which was the case in the past. So I wanted to highlight a couple of key takeaways First, we often hear, or I often heard when I was proposing housing regulations. So I proposed things that both deregulated our housing market and added new regulations. 
I often heard housing is a free market, just let the market decide. But housing is not a free market. Probably folks who are listening know this, but it's important, I think, to just ground ourselves in, in some of these um, key takeaways. Housing is highly regulated and it produces winners and losers. And it has done that over many, many decades um, with all kinds of um, particularly racial implications. Racial exclusion in, in redlining and in zoning and banking, which exacerbates across generations. Um, I think the second point, uh, key point is that it's really important to measure and examine the status quo, what's happening now. Often when I propose a policy change, it it's, goes under great scrutiny, totally understandable, but we always have to take a step back and say, what is happening now? What is happening without change? Because leaving things as they are is a decision too. And I think we have to apply the same scrutiny to our existing conditions as we do to propose change as policymakers. Um, process is really important to determine whose voice is reflected. I think sometimes we, need, we think this means we should add more process, but I've actually found that the, mo the best way to increase equity in, process, in our planning process and our decision-making process is to set a clear timeline and to stick to it and to be really intentional about making sure that everyone is at the table. And when we delay process or you know, don't meet our deadlines, the ones that we said to the community we were going to use, it tends to privilege those people who have the most time and resources to stay involved. And finally, you know, we're gonna talk a lot about what local governments are doing and I'm always so inspired by local governments. Um, there are leaders all over the country, but we also know that our regional and state and federal partners are so critical. It's really great to see folks at the federal level, especially really pushing for housing funding. It's just sometimes when you're at the local level, you feel like you're swimming upstream um, so I, I, I'm, I'm heartened to see more of a national conversation about housing. Every time I speak to folks in another community, even remotely like this, I always wanna make sure to say that, you know, our experience in Minneapolis, there will be lots of commonalities, I'm sure, because all cities and communities across the country are facing a lot of similar pressures in housing, but each community is really different. And I think it's important that our solutions be grounded in the local experience and in the local knowledge of our own communities. So I would never tell you you should do exactly what we did. So the context of our planning process, we had a little bit of an advantage, I think, in that our plan was required. Um, we're required to have an updated plan by state law every 10 years. It's not required to be as, an ex as extensive as ours was, but um, we used it as an opportunity to address a lot of issues in our community. Minneapolis was and still is a growing city with not enough homes for our population and with a stark lack of variety in housing options. And we have very, very extreme racial disparities in housing. And all of these conditions placed a lot of pressure on renters in our city, which is majority renter. And the ward I represented, um, every city council ward is geographically based with about 30,000 residents. My ward is 80% renter by population. So what the plan did was a huge amount of things. There were a hundred policies in the plan. Some of the key things in housing is that we did eliminate single family zoning to allow up to three units in every lot in the city with no carve outs. We did leave fairly restrictive size requirements for those buildings. Um, so basically this in the same footprint. Um, the plan also supports new housing in all neighborhoods, especially concentrated near transit. And the image that you can see is our built for map. For the first time in the city's history, we adopted a, a land, a, an approach to land use and zoning in the comprehensive plan that focused on built form. And each of these colors shows a bulk and height um, that is allowable as of right in that location, particularly focusing larger buildings near transit. So we did adjust some parts of the city down, um, but we also made it so that when a lot is near transit, you are allowed as of right to build a certain amount of bulk and height. And again, previously there was a lot of debate about what the previous plan meant. The city hadn't really up updated the zoning code to make it um, easy to develop the kinds of buildings that the plan said it wanted near transit. 
So our approach again was very incremental. Um, back in 2014, we legalized accessory dwelling units, but only in owner occupied homes. That was a political compromise that I had to make as the author of that ordinance. We reduced parking requirements near transit for multifamily housing. We adopted a complete streets policy and a $400 million investment in streets over 20 years to build out a safer, more accessible street system. We adopted a commitment, a vision zero commitment to eliminate um, traffic deaths and major injuries by 2027. We adopted the city's first protected bikeway plan and funded protected bikeways. We passed the state's first paid sick time and minimum wage laws. We focused on police reform and health-based violence prevention. And we um, entered into a partnership with our local utilities and set greenhouse gas emissions goals. Um, and then kind of in the year before and then after the plan um, was adopted, we legalized triplexes citywide right at the same day that we adopted the plan. Um, and we also re removed that um, home ownership requirement from accessory dwelling units that never should have been there in the first place. We adopted an inclusionary zoning requirement for market rate projects. For the first time in the city's history, we were a bit behind other cities in inclusionary zoning. But now affordable units are required in all buildings over 20 units, although it's phasing in for the smaller buildings because we had seen so few of them in the city. Um, although we, uh, I'll tell you in a second, we, we did some parking reform that's changing that. Uh, we, we legalized cluster development and single room occupancy residences. Again, things that had been banned or made illegal during previous um, code updates in the 90s or so. Um, and the image there is, the picture is um, a shelter that allows folks to have some privacy. They're basically indoor tiny homes. We have really severe winter weather here, which creates a challenge for shelter. But we hear from our unsheltered community that privacy and having their own space is a huge um, barrier to being in more traditional shelters. So this is a hundred unit um, tiny shelter home with wraparound services that's operated by an organization called Avivo. And it was made possible by lots of things, including funding, but it also required this zoning change and would not have been previously allowed. And we targeted our existing funding programs and the new federal money that we got through COVID related supports to focus in race equity in home ownership and other housing programs. We eliminated parking requirements citywide. So um, there is no minimum parking requirement anywhere in the city. And what this really did was open up possibility for much smaller buildings than were previously possible. On a standard city lot, the amount of parking required precluded development of the smaller multifamily housing that so many people tell us they want. And so with this policy change, we're starting to see 16 unit buildings, 30 unit buildings, 50 unit buildings, which basically hadn't been built for decades in Minneapolis without subsidy. And then we passed a significant package of renter protections over many years. We adopted a renter first policy that focuses our regular regulatory services functions on prioritizing the health and safety of renters. It seems obvious, but our previous policies actually went a lot more into mitigating the impact of apartments in a neighborhood. And we license every single rental property in our city. Um, we have for a long time, which was a really important tool that we can leverage to also meet our goals. We passed an ordinance to limit look back for eviction and criminal history for renters. We now require notice of building sale if a, if a landlord is selling their building with some protections for renters. We have a right to counsel with funding for legal services for renters facing eviction. And we, we're, we're doing a convoluted approach to trying to get rent increase caps passed. State law makes it challenging, but we were able to pass a charter during the last election, a charter amendment that would allow the city to pass a future rent control ordinance. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna really quickly talk about you know, our process and some of the outcomes, and then wanna leave a lot of time for questions and conversation. So we were really in, committed to an inclusive process it was really important that we adopted a plan and a timeline and we stuck to that and we had staffs back when they came to us and said, we have to do this or that to stick to the timeline. We brought this through the council incrementally, first adopting goals and policies that helped inform those maps and specific policies. 
Um, and so every time we brought them something through the council, it was aligned with this overall strategy. And this helped us build consensus, community support, political support. So for example, when we adopted the ordinance to eliminate parking requirements, it passed 13-0 and it didn't have its own engagement process. We relied on the engagement that we had already done. Um, so as we did our community engagement, it was really important that we be very frank and clear about our city's history of racial exclusion in housing and the way that our redlining map, um, you know, the federal redlining maps had been codified into city law through our zoning code. So the redlining map was the same as the zoning map. And it's also the same of, as maps like our asthma rate map or infant mortality. Um, because over many decades, the decisions that different levels of government have made have had an, a real impact in people's lives. Um, we talked a lot about, we used a lot of data to show the context of our city um, and particularly to highlight those racial disparities through data. We also really talked to people about their story, their experience living in our city. We didn't go to people with a zoning map and talk about zoning codes. We went to people and talked about what it's like to try to rent a, an apartment in Minneapolis. What's it like to get around our city? And we tried to be really open and accessible for folks to participate. We did um, community dialogues in languages other than English, partnering with community-based organizations and met people where they were at street festivals and fairs, as well as holding more traditional community meetings. We did um, develop this plan over an election cycle where the mayor and all 13 council members were up for re-election or election. And it was therefore really important to stick to that incremental approach and make sure that we are really building community consensus. Of course, there was a lot of debate. I don't want to sugarcoat the amount of opposition there was and the kind of scary headlines. Um, there was lawn sign battles, especially because there was an election taking place. A lot of fear about allowing triplexes leading to whole neighborhoods being bulldozed, um, but also a lot of openness and a huge amount of alignment between different nonprofit organizations and advocacy groups across the spectrum from transportation to criminal justice reform, more traditional housing advocacy organizations, renter-based advocacy organizations, our local Sierra Club. And a lot of that was organized and um, aligned by an organization called uh, Neighbors for More Neighbors, which formed to advocate around this plan specifically and helped really turn people out to meetings um, and helped kind of keep everyone kind of moving on the same page. The final plan passed 12 to one with just one council member um, voting no. We did have to make a lot of amendments, but through that process, we kept the citywide approach so that it was predictable and fair across the city. And we have been implementing the plan. Um, we've updated our transportation action plan and adopted a bunch of ordinances that I talked about earlier, as well as budget investments. And again, with a lot of consensus, um, housing staff are giving an annual report and we also have an inclusionary zoning dashboard to track progress. Um, so change has been very incremental, especially with the triplexes and duplexes. There've only been, you know, not even a hundred built since we first legalized them back in 2015 through accessory dwelling units. Um, some people might say, what's the point? But I think for, um, you know, if you measure over decades, um, allowing more flexibility like this will make a real difference in a lot of people's lives. We have seniors who built an accessory dwelling unit and moved in and are renting their home. We have lots of multi-generational families living together. So I still stand by this as a, a smart approach that cities can use. Um, we heard from the development community on the other side that if we adopted inclusionary zoning, they wouldn't build again ever in the city. That's not happening. This data is a little old and the pandemic makes it hard to measure things, but so far we haven't seen a drop in development. There was a little peak um, with people getting projects in frantically before we adopted these policies, but it's leveling out and it's about the same as it has been in previous years. And for now in Minneapolis, rents are decreasing, um, kind of bucking a national trend. Um, Jana Flissrand wrote this article in a local um, blog. She was also one of the advocates and organizers um, she even compared our rents to St. Paul across the river. So uh, we do seem to be um, having some success in stabilizing rents. Of course, you know, there are folks who wish rents would continue to go up, 
Um, but for people who are renting in our city, again, more than half our population, we have been seeing really steep increases and this is a breath of fresh air. So that's where I'll stop. And thanks again, I really look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that presentation. And now